So welcome, I'm Julia Cohen, Managing Director of Plastic Pollution Coalition. Thank you for joining our global webinar series, which brings our community together to share the latest information, tips, and resources to help stop the plastic pollution crisis. Welcome to our October webinar, The Cost of Convenience, The Quest for Solutions to the Plastic Pollution Crisis, where we'll be focusing on the connection between the plastic pollution crisis and environmental injustice around the world, where economically disadvantaged nations take in a larger share of the world's trash and manufacturing chemicals threaten predominantly Black, BIPOC, and low-income communities. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a growing global alliance of more than 1,200 organizations, businesses, and thought leaders in 75 countries, working to educate, connect, and advocate for a more just, equitable world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. We wanted to share a few tips before we get started. Um, and just reminder again, we've turned off the chat now and to share your questions in the Q&A. Um, and also upvote your favorite questions. And finally, feel free to tag the panelists on social and tag us at Plastic Pollutes. And before I introduce the panelists, I also wanted to let everyone know that Island Press is offering a limited edition 30% discount just for the attendees of this webinar for Erica Serino's new book, Thicker Than Water, The Quest for Solutions to the Plastic Crisis. Okay, so let's get to it without further ado. As I said, the topic for today is the cost of convenience and uh, the quest for solutions to the plastic pollution crisis. And we are honored to be joined by our three expert panelists today. They will be giving you presentations about their work, um, after which we'll have a discussion and answer questions. So without um, taking any more time, it's my pleasure to welcome our amazing panelists. Uh, joining us today are Erica Serino, science writer, artist, and author. Dr. Sadat Gondogdu, Associate Professor of Microplastic Research Group, joining us from uh, Turkey in the middle of the night. Super grateful. Um, he is with the Faculty of Fisheries at the University of Kukurova. And Dr. Karim Odakan, environmental justice advocate and clinical assistant professor of medicine at Stony Brook University. Thank you all so much. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you all to Erica Serino, science writer and artist who explores the intersection of the human and non-human worlds. Her photographic and written works have appeared in Scientific American, The Guardian, Vice, Hakai Magazine, The Atlantic, and other esteemed publications. Her latest book, Thicker Than Water, The Quest for Solutions to the Plastic Crisis, brings readers on a globe hopping journey to meet the scientists and activists telling the real story of the plastic crisis. And I must say it's beautifully written to Erica. I've really been enjoying kind of your lyrical style of so going kind. in depth Thank into you. these stories that like I know the, the headlines, but the way, the way you bring readers in to them is is beautiful at the same time it's poignant so well, erica thank so please much. thank you thank you so here's my book <laughs> as you saw um my introduction to the plastic crisis started when i was a teenager um, i've worked as a wildlife rehabilitator since i was 15 years old and something i noticed um, in my treating of sick injured and orphaned wildlife was that many of the creatures that i encountered had been injured or harmed um, or killed due to plastic so whether it was fishing line wrapped around a wing, um, a balloon string wrapped around some legs, ingested plastic um, and whatnot, it's a, it's a highly lethal substance. And I've seen this in, in the animals that I've treated. Um, but then later on, um, I realized unless we address the actual problem, we're just gonna keep treating symptoms to the problem like the wildlife I was treating. Um, and that made me very hungry to understand what is the scope of the plastic crisis and what are the actual solutions? Because obviously what we're doing to date has not been working. So to really understand what's been going on, I set off to cross the Pacific Garbage Patch, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So this is this mythical place that you know has been much talked about in the media as a floating island of garbage. And in fact, that is not what it is. Um, we sailed more than 3,000 nautical miles from Los Angeles, California to Honolulu, Hawaii, 
crossing what is known as the Eastern North Pacific Gyre, which is a circulating current of water that tends to carry a lot of plastic in it. Um, we're out there and there's no dump. It's literally just a soup of plastic stuff. So you see an item float by and then another item. Here's a, a tangle of nets, which we would call a ghost net, um, a piece of a fish crate. I mean, it was just a lot of stuff. And then we dipped our research equipment into the water and we realized that it's not just these larger plastic items, um, you know, everything we've seen from light bulbs to televisions, um, pieces of uh, foam just floating in the middle of the ocean, but it's actually what happens when these plastic items that we use every day break up into smaller and smaller pieces known as micro and nanoplastic. And these pieces of plastic have their own chemical burden. They have the chemicals used to make plastic in them and they also contain chemicals picked up from nature. Um, so we're talking about pesticides and other persistent organic pollutants that adhere to the surface of these plastic particles. And there's microplastic and nanoplastic all around us. Um, it's not only in the oceans, although the oceans being a huge repository of plastic stuff have a lot of microplastic in it. Um, so much so that when I traveled to a beach in Hawaii, uh, it's called Camillo Beach, it's on the south point of the big island of Hawaii. Um, this beach is completely covered with plastic for the simple reason that it lies directly in the spinning gyres path. So, so much plastic washes up on the shore and that also means a ton of microplastic is churned up as that plastic stuff is, is being pulled back into shore. I was just on another plastic call with um, plastic artist Pam Longabardi and she actually said it really well. When she visited Camillo Beach, she saw the plastic as being kind of regurgitated back on land from the ocean as if the earth was rebelling. And I really love that image and it really feels that way. I feel terrible for the dog about to step into this water because that is all microplastic. Um, another scene from Camilo Beach. And clearly, you know, plastic is not good for wildlife. Here's a parrotfish that unfortunately washed up on the beach. Um, but it's also not good for people. And I think the more that we can connect that, you know, we are not separate from nature and, and empathize with the other beings around us, the better. Again, my first view at the plastic crisis was through a wildlife point of view, because that was what I was doing with my life at that time. Um, and indeed, out on the ocean, we saw that the, even the fish that we caught to eat, and we were living on a simple steel sloop. There were no accommodations. Um, we had a bucket as a toilet and there was no shower. You use a separate bucket with seawater if you wanted to take a shower. And this was 24 days. Um, and again, we made, we ate mostly out of uh, cans, bags, um, sachets of, of food that we could bring on the boat. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the fish that we did caught, um, the fish that we caught, it was filled with plastic. Um, so what are the consequences? I got a three year research stint in Denmark at Roskilde University with one of the scientists I sailed with, his name is Christian Suberg. Um, and there I studied kind of the toxic, the toxicology of plastic and understand what are the health risks and how much plastic is actually around us. I mean, there's so many questions still today. Um, at another university nearby, I spent time with scientists studying the fact that we breathe in plastic particles. So again, as I said, the plastic around us is not it's not ever going to degrade. It's not going to decompose like if you threw a banana peel in a compost pile. That's not what happens to plastic. Plastic breaks up into smaller pieces that are still plastic. They still have the chemical load um, of, a, of a plastic item, but now it's broken up into a tiny piece that you might easily ingest or drink or even inhale, scientists are finding. Um, so here's an experiment where this mannequin has two mechanical lungs inside and through those tube-like nostrils breathes in air and that mouth breathes in air. Um, and the scientists found that we, we are likely breathing at least 11 particles of plastic per hour inside our homes. So it's just inside. Um, outside is a whole nother story, right? So we've completely changed the, the landscape of our planet um, simply because we are addicted to stuff. And the corporations benefiting off of all this garbage are making much, so much money and we're left to deal with the mess. So this is a, a major problem. This was a pattern that emerged when I started investigating the story of plastic is that it's not just plastic is this great, convenient, useful material. It's being made and used in like awful abundance um, to the point where, you know, you stop to think about it. 
it really is the perfect consumer material because we are literally instructed to buy, throw away, and then buy again. Corporations are brilliant because they will just keep making money as we're left to deal with the mess because currently there's no accountability um, or very little accountability, I should say. But nonetheless, um, Sadat will talk further about um, you know, shipping waste to other countries, but I wanna talk about not only the effects of plastic on our planet and our wildlife, but on people. And it's not just, you know, plastic is around us and we're being exposed to the chemicals, which scientists are about are on the verge of sharing some very apparently interesting information with us um, about the health effects of plastic and, and what it does to our bodies, which is a field of research that has been really ignored for a very long time. Um, for various reasons. One of them is that it's very hard to study one single thing's effect on people because we are exposed to so many different things all the time. So proving the causation between exposure to plastic um, and, and some kind of disease is not always so straightforward. But there are many other issues with plastic health effects um, that Karim will discuss um, the health effects and it's not always as straightforward as it seems. So here is the Brookhaven landfill um, that we will talk about, I'm sure, later on. Uh, and landfills emit not only greenhouse gases, but toxic gases that can harm our bodies, our respiratory systems, trigger asthma. And this is, this is a landfill actually that accepts ash. So the incinerator that sends some ash to this landfill. There are several incinerators on Long Island where we are based, or I am based and Karim is based. Um, but these landfills accept ash and the incinerator is actually in my neighborhood and sends its trash over towards Karim. So that's kind of remarkable and scary. Um, you know, there's greenhouse gases and chemicals being emitted near me and also near him. Um, not to mention the effects to land, water, um, and just how it affects people. I mean, what are the consequences of living next to either a landfill or an incinerator or an illegal dump? There are psychological effects too. And not only there at the disposal end, but also where plastic is made. So in 2020, right before the pandemic was declared um, in mid-March, I actually made it down to the so-called Cancer Alley, um, which is an 85 mile stretch of land along both banks of the Mississippi between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And this is an enormous area of um, industrial development, specifically refineries and plastic um, production complexes. And the enormous amount of petrochemicals being produced here puts people living on the front lines who are predominantly black, sorry, black, brown, um, indigenous and Latinx on the front lines of disaster at all times and also at the front lines of health risks. So, um, many of the people I've met who were living near refineries could remember, you know, oh, in this year there was a giant fire, in this year there was a giant explosion. And imagine having that right next to your home. It's, it's completely unnerving and you are always on the precipice of the next disaster. Um, and that's just not fair. And especially if we look at the racial aspect, we can see how the corporations churning out plastic waste have targeted these communities already marginalized in society, further exacerbating the effects of systemic racism. And it is horrifying and it's, it's well past time to take a stand. And I think that this part of the plastic story is not talked about enough. Sure, it is a blight on our planet. Sure, it harms wildlife and that is terrible. And I do, you know, I have a close connection with wildlife so I feel empathy in that realm too. But if we can't look around and say, is this harming our, my fellow human beings? there's something wrong with that. And, I, and that's a huge argument I make in my book, you know, from extraction of the fossil fuel components of plastic, um, you know, plastic, conventional plastic is made from fossil fuels, um, either gas or oil, and now heavy fuels as the um, petrochemical corporations struggle to kind of make a profit from our dwindling fossil fuel reserves. And also in a world where um, climate change is happening and regulations on emissions are sometimes tightening in certain places. So they wanna produce more plastic because that's the way to keep in business. Um, so when I went to St. James Parish, um, I met Rise St. James, an amazing environmental justice group fighting the um, construction of yet another plastic facility um, in their region. And this would be a $9.4 billion factory, thousands of acres making many different types of plastics and emitting um, huge amounts of chemicals into the air 
as well as possibly plastic nurdles, which are the raw plastic pellets. And um, the woman in the red cape, her name is Diane Wilson. She lives next to a factory. It's called, um, the company is called Formosa Plastics. And they are um, near her home in, um, in Texas. And yet she came to Louisiana to St. James Parish where Formosa is planning this $9.4 billion complex um, to be with Sharon Levine and Rye St. James, her group, because she was telling them, listen, I've lived it. I've lived next to Formosa. You cannot afford to build another factory. Um, we cannot, sorry, the dog is distracting. <laughs> you cannot um, afford to let this factory be built in your area because you're really going to suffer like my community did. And so um, Diane has been an ally in this way. And I think it's really important that we do seek each other out and help each other because this is a problem that's bigger than any of us. These corporations are enormous, you know, tens of billions of dollars. Um, and, and they have, you know, it's, I don't wanna say they have power because people have power, but they're going to do all they can to, to keep us down. And that is what they are doing. Um, but communities are fighting back. And part of that is educating each other and, and keeping each other um, aware of what is going on. And that has been very important in, in organizing and acting to stop this further development. And actually St. James succeeded in 2019 in stopping a plastic factory. So their next target is the Formosa factory. So they succeeded once and I do have faith that they will succeed again. Um, and you know, in terms of solutions, it's gonna be many solutions to this problem. It's not one thing, but I, I strongly believe this dog, I strongly believe that um, our values really matter. And until we change the systems that are churning out waste, we will not be able to fundamentally change this problem and solve this problem. Um, there's a lot of accountability that needs to happen. There's a lot of self-reflection that needs to happen. And you know, many of us are so used to our convenient lifestyles and that's what's been sold to us. And it's, some people are afraid of change, um, but as I like to point out in my experience, um, I lived on this simple sailboat in the most beautiful place to me in the world, which was out on the ocean. And that beauty is what keeps me going and knowing that people are also so beautiful and that we do want change, many of us, and we want to work together um, because plastic is a scourge at this point. And yes, it can help us. It, can, it has led to medical advancements that has saved lives and that is important but it has been weaponized against us as this colonial, all-consuming material that really um, harms people, really does. This is some of my artwork. Um, you know, recently there's been news that microplastic was found on both sides of the placenta in, um, in females. I think there was about six women in the study and they found, um, again, on both sides of the placenta. So there was a clear transfer, it seemed, of uh, microplastic from mother to child. And this is all microplastic that I've collected off of beaches and made a fetus out of it just to, to show people. Um, here's another image where a hand is grasping for plastic. So a lot of my work shows bodies and, and plastic, specifically microplastic. Let me get this dog off of my lap. Zabi. Okay. There you go. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, <laughs> back, to, back to business here. Um, so I like to do a lot of work with children too, um, in terms of my art, because I think the more that we get people involved in seeing and feeling the problem up close, the more we can understand the far reaching effects and beauty is a way in and getting that emotional connection is a way in. And so this is work made by students um, on the east end of Long Island. And, you know, we're, we're looking at the beauty. So there's the turtle, but then there's plastic. So it makes you think twice, what is that material? Um, and it is a free, widely available art resource. So I, I urge any educators who might be listening to please use it um, if you can. I think that it is really important to teach young people um, what this material is all about. And it's very troubling um, past, present and future. Hopefully not the future. Um, part of my work too is, is teaching science. So I, I like to fuse art and science. Here are students that were out on a beach on Long Island, um, if anyone recognizes Sunken Meadow State Park. So I went out there with about 350 third graders. It was a crazy day, it was so fun. Um, and we all descended on the beach and we picked up trash, logged it. So I sh you can see um, some clipboards here. 
I think it's really important that we also learn the scientific aspect of our world and also understand how our world works. And that's one way in is this kind of, we call it um, community science where we, we can all be scientists. And that is true. Um, you know, fundamentally, if we all fo follow some kind of scientific method and ask our own questions and try to answer them by exploring and creating, it's really a beautiful thing. Um, and then I encourage art. So I asked these children to depict a fun day at the beach and they came up with this really ha guy having fun. He has a beer in his hands, um, but it just shows you, it's like really remarkable what you can do when you just harness that creativity and just make people think twice, like, wow, that was made out of garbage. Um, so unique and interesting. Um, and I'm keeping it brief because my I know I have two amazing panelists with me and I want them to, to share their stories, but um, that's the gist of me and my book and what I do. I'm really glad to see everyone here and I hope that we can all work together to address the plastic crisis. Thank you so much, Erica. That was um, a really powerful and, and yet beautiful presentation. Um, and we're so grateful for your work. Um, let me introduce now Dr. Sadat Gundogu who is a marine biologist and a member of the Microplastic Research Group at the Facility of Fisheries at the University of Kukurova. He is a member of the Microplastic Research Group and his research focuses also focuses on the effects of illegal dumping and incineration activities in the waste trade and their impact on environments. Currently, he is studying the distribution of plastics and additive chemicals in protected areas, as well as their effects on endangered species. Welcome, Dr. Gundugo. Hi, uh, hi, I'm from Turkey at the uh, middle of night. Uh, uh, I'm really happy to be here with Erika's uh, book to discuss uh, one of the most uh, popular environmental problem, plastic pollution. Uh, but I will start to talk about the, the reason that Erika contacted with me, uh, the waste trade and its effect on the Turkish environment. And also uh, it, 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 it goes to social injustice and uh, some other environmental problems. Uh, let me share the screen with you. Well, this picture taken uh, by me at south of Turkey, Adana, uh, where I live and work, and also discovered this illegal dumping activities mainly happening in the city. Uh, you see there is a teddy bear, he just uh, closed her or him uh, eyes. I, I don't know who made this uh, scan, but it's really uh, ironic because there is a, a UK a flagged uh, imported plastic just dumped here. This is a very center of a city. It's kind of the middle of city center. There are too many buildings and uh, business and also other facilities, factories, also plastic uh, factories, recycling facilities. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, picture for me that I took uh, during my investigation uh, for documentation of illegal uh, dumping activities. So why I called new and old destination for world unwanted plastic waste? Because new uh, Turkey became uh, the main destination for plastic waste uh, after Chinese ban. Uh, why old? Because Turkey just recently banned, not banned, but made some really, really uh, good restriction on uh, plastic waste imports, so uh, it's not easy to uh, import plastic anymore to Turkey. So before talking about waste, we should uh, define what's waste, uh, because all of us generate waste. Also, we, we, we live with uh, waste. Uh, uh, we are familiar uh, because it's, it's, uh, we, we, we meet every day with waste. But... Uh, there is a specific uh, feature of, there is a specific uh, reason that we, sh we should uh, mention uh, uh, about waste, because waste may be the only thing that no one owns, but that everyone uh, generates. So there is no property on, on waste. The only 
uh, owner is governments or uh, some spe specific companies that uh, taking uh, giving the service to the government in terms of some uh, taxes that we pay uh, to government. So uh, in circularity and I mean circularity, but it's not really circular. Uh, if you define plastic uh, waste as a raw material, then it can be a tradable material. Then you can find uh, someone generates plastics in another part of the world, like uh, UK waste in Turkey or uh, uh, US waste in Malaysia or in an African country. So uh, everything is about definition. So we call it, why, uh, why I'm uh, talking about the definition, because uh, there is a colonialist background uh, about the waste trade, the, the first uh, colonialist uh, mention that we know uh, date back to Summer's memo. Or if you have interest on this issue, you can find you can easily find this uh, document leak happened uh, in the beginning of 1990. Uh, this is uh, Lawrence Summers, one of the uh, economists of uh, World Bank, and he's just talking about. Uh, undeveloped, uh, underdeveloped countries deserve this waste because they don't deserve to live in in good environment. So how? This is uh, his quotation. This is why we are calling this. Uh, uh, we are defining uh, waste trade as uh, colonialism, waste colonialism. So the main theory is uh, produced. Uh, waste produced in rich countries uh, has a really high cost for disposal and then they are sending it with low cost to the poor countries because the poor countries don't have such effective waste management or effective uh, uh, rules and also there are too many companies that want to bring this waste and to earn money so the, 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 the latest statistics about the waste rate is like this. Some OECD countries sending plastic waste to non-OECD countries. It means that non-OECD countries mostly in Southern uh, Asian countries. Uh, the only OECD country that receives huge amount of waste is Turkey. You see? Here, the, the, the uh, historical change in imported waste to Turkey, and uh, in, uh, according to their types, uh, most of the plastics imported is a very common one. We use in our, every daily life uh, of uh, every uh, of our, uh, our life, like this package, and we use this HDPE and LDPE as a kitchen material or, or everything that you can, uh, you, you know about plastic because the main plastic is actually polyethylene. It's a, uh, almost 40% of uh, global production of plastics is polyethylene. So there is a sharp decline in, in May, uh, May of this year because in May of this year, Turkey released a new legislation. Uh, it banned uh, ethylene polymer type of plastic, which is 70% uh, of the to imported, total imported plastics. Uh, Turkey uh, released a new ban. And then uh, plastic import uh, declined from 30,000 tons from UK, for instance, 30,000 tons in March to 700 tons in August. So it's quite sharp decline. So you can see some picture and some news uh, uh, about the, the, the fate of this uh, problem. Turkey became European uh, trash bin or dust uh, uh, or waste bin or something like that. Now we, we are in, in, in good condition because uh, the plastic industry made lobbying activities against this ban and then the government overturned this ban, but still there is a de facto ban because of some restriction, for instance, contamination level. 
one uh, percent, which is not easy to find one percent contaminated plastic waste in the world. So it's, it makes plastic import impossible and also some other restriction making plastic import hard. But still, we cannot say that it's stopped because uh, we are living in, in Turkey and then uh, everything can be changed in, in from day to uh, next day. Uh, we, we can guarantee this uh, restriction. It has to be, it has to be uh, regulated by exporter as well. Let's talk about the waste uh, generation uh, of ratio of Turkey because Turkey importing uh, around 1 million tons of plastic waste from uh, other countries, but the country cannot even cannot handle uh, their own waste. We are producing uh, almost three, 32 million tons of municipal waste and only 10% of them are being managed uh, in, in, in good manner. So 90%, almost 19% is being dumped in a landfill area. So you see the only working part of the waste management system is this informal waste picker, which uh, mostly this advantaged group of people are working in this uh, sector. And nowadays in Istanbul, the main city, the one of the biggest city of Turkey, uh, the government planning to eliminate this uh, waste pickers in, from system. But the whole the country has waste management like this, like this two waste bin. You can see this waste bin in, in any city in, in, in part of Turkey. So how it marketed uh, to import plastic, you see? All those companies have such facilities in, in theory, in pictures, but in reality is like the right side. All this waste piles, I mean, the, the, uh, this one ton big plastic bags full of plastic, just outside and without any, any uh, regulation or any controls. Also, uh, there are too many illegal activities happening, like burning and incinerating this in open air. You see, this is a UK uh, car plate and uh, some burning activities happening. I would like to show this video. This is really, uh, you see. This area is one of the largest dumping area and it burned like two months, you know, two months it burned like that. You see this black smoke just going over the city. Uh, Three million people living in this city. Yeah. So uh, we are decided to map, uh, you know, this illegal dumping sites. We uh, determined over 30 uh, different uh, illegal dumping sites, also incineration sites around, uh, around the Adana. Adana is my city. That this is only Adana case. We also have such cases in other cities, but it has to be just to be documented. And the second map is about facility fires. Uh, we have really uh, common activities happening in Turkey. In every month, more than six and seven facilities are being burned uh, without any reason. This is map of. Uh, recycling facility fires happening in Turkey between uh, 2022 and, uh, and now. You see how it's common in all around the country. The location is uh, also matching with specific uh, recycling facilities location. So all these uh, facilities uh, burning without you know, any uh, specific reason because there is no uh, investigation, yeah, there is. Um, some, there are some investigation, but it's not really investigation. It's just someone burned, or some some. It happened because of the electricity uh, thing, or something like that. But uh, or most of this uh, fire happened at night and in storage part. What a surprise! So uh, I found some very epic pictures, like. Uh, even one of the most familiar water brands and uh, 
is from our Ireland and also reduce reuse and recycle back imported from UK and I found this in in the middle of nowhere in Adana and this is also another honest I don't know oh, which country's uh, brand but there are some uh, labels on this you know please recycle and this is the uh, recycling actually so I have another video to, to, to explain between microplastic pollution and uh, recycling and waste import activities, because this creek receiving wastewater from uh, recycling facilities. Look, this white tiny particles are microplastics. This is just flowing uh, directly to the Mediterranean Sea. This may uh, you see, this is that this microplastics, shredded microplastics, shredded plastics, actually uh, intentionally shredded. It's not a, like uh, degraded in, in environment. And making this picture, the most polluted coast of the Mediterranean Sea. We have, we have the like most polluted coast of Mediterranean Sea is in the north, north, northeastern part of Turkish coast, like here, you see this uh, purple one. And also in other maps, it's like really, really red. And 31 kilogram per kilometer per day, just uh, washing up to the beaches every day. This is really too much because one, one plastic bottle is around 10 gram. And we are talking about 31 kilogram per day and per kilometer. It's, it's uh, all this uh, plastic uh, import export issue making Turkish coast our most polluted coast. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, Sadat, and thank you for staying up so late. We're really appreciative of um, your work and research and sharing it with us. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, so I want to just jump right to introducing Dr. Karim Odekan, who is a primary care physician and a clinical assistant professor of medicine at Stony Brook University. Um, we are so grateful to have you here to talk about um, the work you've been doing with Brookhaven Landfill Actions Remediation Group. You're an environmental justice advocate. You've been helping to stop the expansion of the largest active landfill in Long Island. And you also, prior to your career in medicine, you were a city planner and policy analyst for the New York City Department of Housing and Preservation. And you have a master's in economics from University of Madison and a master's in regional planning from Cornell. Um, what a, you know, what a great combination of things to help us in this challenge. Thank you so much for joining us, Karim. Thank you so much for having me. What, what a wonderful community to be a part of right now. So um, hello everyone, I'm here representing the Brookhaven Landfill Action and Remediation Group. We're a community environmental justice coalition focused on closing and remediating the Brookhaven Landfill and advocating for zero waste solutions. Um, to waste planning in Long Island. Uh, in this picture on the left, you'll see uh, some of the founders of our coalition, Ms. Hannah Thomas, Monique Fitzgerald, and on the right, Dennis Nix. Uh, Ms. Thomas has been fighting the Brookhaven landfill since it, before it was cited in 1974, and Mr. Nix is a former landfill employee. We have a small army of uh, active community members and organizations, too many to name right now, but I wanted to acknowledge their work, um, which is, uh, seemingly endless. Uh, we formed in the streets uh, during the BLM protests that followed George Floyd's uh, death, and we were looking at you know, issues of systemic racism within our communities. The Brookhaven landfill uh, was cited in 1974 with a plan to close in the early 90s by the state of New York. Um, instead, to satisfy the ever-expanding consumption of 2 million people, it's been continuously expanded. It's now a 270 foot monument to environmental injustice and our inability to plan for the future. A Long Island comprises, uh, just to give folks who aren't from here some, uh, an overview, two counties, 13 towns, and 3 million people were in the New York City metro area as well. So it's a huge um, uh, uh, 
community of folks. Um, and this landfill that we're talking about accepts 2 million people's uh, incinerator ash, uh, which is, as Erica was mentioning earlier, burned in a Covanta incinerator and then uh, trucked and dumped in this landfill along with construction and demolition de debris. As a community uh, organization, our, our our landfill was initially slated to close in 2024, and then we found that the town and the state had been planning its expansion um, since as early as 2017, um, and, and they attempting to, they were saying it's a new Asheville adjacent to the old one. It's interesting to note that they didn't look at any other communities in Long Island for the placement of this new Asheville. Uh, and last year, our community coalition successfully fought back and stopped the Asheville expansion. So it's nice to win um, sometimes. And, uh, you know, why do we care about this? Um, we're organizing in North Bellport and the entire 500,000 person town of Brookhaven. Uh, this North Bellport is a beautiful community, which became a majority minority community in the 1960s as a product of Long Island's geographic segregation. And according to the CDC, the um, North Bellport, which is the community adjacent to Brookhaven solid waste management facility and landfill has the lowest life expectancy in all of Long Island. It's about 20 years lower than the highest life expectancy community, which is predominantly white in Shelter Island. It's a diverse, largely black, Latinx, indigenous community of roughly 12,000 people. And the interesting thing is outside of North Belpore and the other communities surrounding the landfill, few know where their trash ends up when they place it on the curb. It's something that's kind of magical. It just disappears. And um, in some sense, people don't wanna know. It hurts to know. Um, our work has been uplifting the people who experience um, and the experiences of people who bear the brunt of um, our garbage. Uh, you know, when we start organizing, people can't imagine that um, hydrogen sulfide coming out of their garbage would cause a middle school to close. Um, but that happened here. Um, we invite them to imagine and then join their neighbors and saying, like, this has to end. There has to be a better way. And just as a brief overview, because I know we're talking to like an domestic international audience. Um, environmental justice as a movement addresses the fact that people who live, work, and play in some of the most polluted communities are commonly people of color and poor folks, and this is no accident. Communities of color and poor communities are routinely targeted to host facilities um, that have negative environmental impacts. And in terms of environmental justice policy, this calls for fair treatment, which means no disproportionate share of negative environmental consequences and meaningful involvement, which means that folks' ability to participate in the decisions that affect their environment and health, uh, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And that's coming from the federal EPA. That's not some radical environmental organization. It's also important to say that we're not a NIMBY co coalition. We're not a not in my backyard coalition. In fact, we have 2 million people's garbage in our backyard and we deal with the plumes, the smells, the trucks, the fumes, the pollution on a daily basis. Uh, when the landfill is closed, the problems remain. We wouldn't wish this on our worst enemies. We started investigating if and how the state was planning the waste future for 3 million people. We saw how our local government had no public approved waste plan at all in the past decade. We saw how waste haulers were actually writing New York State's waste plans through the now defunct New York State convened Long Island Sol Solid Waste Leadership Council and how New York State DEC blocked our legal request to read these plans, which we ended up getting anyway. Um, we saw how affected communities were systematically excluded from the planning process and how in the absence of planning, the plan was just to ship our waste to communities who couldn't fight. Um, and we decided we can become accountable for our waste and we can uh, overcome this sense of being overwhelmed that this is a pro problem outside of our control. So it's kind of interesting. This, the, the public conversation on garbage actually uh, was initiated really in 1987 with the, the famous garbage barge of Long Island, Mobro 4000. This is a barge that uh, in 1987 started traveling down the entire Eastern seaboard and was rejected by all ports, including Mexico and Belize before being brought back up. And that trash was incinerated and dumped back in Islip. At the time, the newscaster Dan Rather called it the most watched load of garbage in the memory of man. And for a brief moment, Long Island had a public discussion on garbage. In the 35 year, years since, we've had no public, regional, sustainable, equitable waste planning. 
there's been lots of little committees and things like that, but nothing um, has really uh, become a real public accountable conversation. Um, our goal as a group is to start to get Long Island talking about our trash in a meaningful, equitable, and sustainable way. And it's just important to know that we can't recycle our way out of this crisis. Um, you know, we need to talk about our consumption and the life cycle of our waste. This is a slide of our local Brookhaven Municipal Recycling Facility in 2018, which is adjacent to the landfill after China stopped accepting our recyclables. We were literally bursting at the seams with plastic, as you can see from this drone footage above. Um, and, you know, I, you guys, this, I feel like this audience knows this. This is a slide from UNDP of our global plastic waste generation, which has increased sixfold in my lifetime. Uh, in the US, in my lifetime, our population increased 40%, but municipal solid waste doubled. So we are obviously doing something wrong. Uh, we need to regulate how we deal with waste at the source with impacted communities at the forefront, which um, is really missing from a lot of this conversation. Um, so what can be done at the lo local level? Um, the, the approach that we've been taking, and I feel like we've learned a lot from other community organizations um, that have been fighting this battle, is follow the trash and follow the cash. And what do I mean by follow the trash? The question is, who is being impacted, all right? In Brookhaven, we've been following our trash all the way 615 miles to the Rust Belt of Ohio and speaking to communities there who are now going to receive our, our garbage. Um, we've been speaking with communities in Pennsylvania, communities that, uh, whose waste transfer stations are you know, transferring our waste in Queens and Brooklyn. We've been talking to impacted communities who have been accepting our garbage or who will be accepting our garbage and deserve to have their voices heard. Uh, and in the process, we've had middle schoolers in Ohio write to our town supervisor in New York. Um, we've had Zoom conferences with them. We've been, uh, you know, we, I, I think the strategy of finding out who is being impacted um, by the trash in your area and, and how do you find that? We've been foiling permits. We've been foiling waste plans. We've been talking to um, our elected officials on record all the time. Um, and then the, the second thing is to follow the cash. You know, our landfill generated half a billion dollars in revenue to the town of Brookhaven in the last decade alone. We should have the world's best solid waste management plan uh, around. Instead, we have actually no approved solid waste management plan. Um, and, you know, the recipients are one thing. Not, it doesn't mention the waste haulers. I mean, we found that uh, through uh, leaked documents that the, the state of New York would not give us, that the waste haulers were actually writing our Long Island Solid Waste Leadership Council plan. It's amazing. Um, and I should say, when I talk about the revenue from this landfill, like it's a $66 million in gross revenue in a municipality that has a budget of $310 um, million a year. So this is big money. Um, but uh, the money tells us where we need to apply pressure and apply people power, because at the end of the day, uh, the politicians and the lobbyists don't vote and they don't stop the trucks. And uh, I think that that's where our power lies. The next question, uh, next slide is basically, so in a, in a place where we have no regional waste planning, we have this 300 foot monument to environmental justice overshadowing our schools, our homeless shelters, our communities, um, and we have no local government initiating waste audit. Folks in North Bellport and the surrounding communities have taken things into their own hands. Um, where this is a, on the left, this is a picture of our, uh, our trash ninjas led by Gabrielle Houston, uh, which is community waste audits. We've been going in the dark of night, going through people's garbage and doing the audits that our town and our state uh, are not doing. And in the process, we're building hope, we're building power, and we're building a public conversation and education campaign that we cannot be at the mercy of the waste industry. This is our issue and we need to own it every day. Uh, and on the left, uh, on the bottom, this is our community compost in a community garden where we had a pilot project uh, in the community adjacent to the landfill of, um, it's not plastic waste, but food, food waste um, and composting. And we started this widely successful small pilot program. And then in the top, we're vis this is us visiting BK Ra in Brooklyn, learning about how to take this to scale. Um, and then, you know, 
this last slide is just basically, if you want to read more about the work that we're doing, you, you should read Erica's excellent article that just came out uh, last week in the Revelator because uh, it's a really fantastic overview. And I'm just going to end with, um, you know, uh, our colleague Mish Menda is saying, it's amazing to see how our support has, uh, support has expanded from our community into a constellation of allies who are speaking out together for justice because, um, those that have been harmed deserve to have their voices heard. And, and I think that that's true, whether you're in Brookhaven, whether you're in Turkey, whether you're in the middle of the ocean. Thank you so much, Karim. Um, we definitely can't recycle our way out of this problem. And you so eloquently um, connected all of these dots. Um, we wanted to just take a moment to say that for those who can stay, we're going to extend the webinar for 15 minutes to make sure we have time for more discussion and to talk about some of the questions. Um, but for those of you who have to hop off, be, be sure to check in um, for our next webinar, November 10th, where we'll have the filmmakers and folks featured in the film from the story of plastic documentary and um, talking about storytelling and the power of um, narrative in this movement and all of our efforts. And that's November 10th. So um, let me just jump in with um, some of the questions that were submitted ahead of time that we think would be really um, powerful for you guys to address and talk about. Um, here's one from Stephanie in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. I run a marine shrink wrap recycling program. I have not been able to find out what happens to the wrap we recycle after it's bailed. The vendors we use say it is recycled domestically, but are vague when pushed for more. I want to know if our recycled plastic ends up becoming pollution in other countries, and I'm looking for tips on how to get that info. Does the government track where our plastic recycling happens? Are there many plants in the US that process plastic for recycling? Maybe Sadat, I don't know if you want to tackle that one. Yeah, the US government trying to find new destination for this uh, waste collected in terms of recycling, like in Africa, making new agreements with some countries like Kenya and uh, Ghana or other other African countries. So uh, as Karim, Dr. Karim said, follow your waste and ask ask question about the fate of your waste you, you put in right bin in terms of recycling. So uh, recycling itself is kind of myth. Uh, so there is no actually recycling, turn the tap. Thank you. Um, well, and along those lines, another question from uh, Christine in Hilo, Hawaii. How can we address the misguided push for plastic reformation schemes, which take discarded plastic and reform them into things such as benches and roads to get put back into the environment where they degrade into microplastics? Erica, do you want to take that? Sure, thank you. Um, that's a really great question because clearly recycling, as my amazing panelists, co-panelists have reiterated, it's not the answer, and the answer is to turn off the tap. And the ice cream man is going by, so apologies for any music. Um, <laughs> I keep having all these things happen. Um, in short, um, a lot of those schemes are actually run by the same chemical corporations that are trying to sell us more plastic. So that is a way, and I've seen this with Dow Chemical, for example, I, in India, I believe, um, was one of the biggest projects to make a plastic road and to use trash to recycle it into a road made out of plastic. And it's like, that's putting the plastic burden somewhere else. Again, it's not going away. It's not really being dealt with. That road is going to crumble and degrade and spew plastic into the air and into water and into the, the earth. So these recycling schemes are really not the answer. I mean, again, we should not rely on them. Is it great to make, as for example, I do art or um, turning things into other materials? Yes, but the full, the real, way that we could use plastic is if we could just circularly use it again and again. But that's not happening because there's no accountability for collection. There's no accountability for what happens to it. Um, and a lot of different plastics are made in an unregulated manner that contain all different types of chemicals and all different types of formulations. So it's not easy to just plug and play and say, oh, here's some expanded polyethylene. I'm going to turn it into this other thing. It's just, it's more complicated than that. And um, again, turning off the tap is the way to go. So these schemes are kind of greenwashing. Thank you. 
And Dr. Kara, maybe you could um, add on to that about the health connections and implications from, you know, along the entire supply chain. Um, and, you know, Erica showed and re referred to, you know, that microplastics and nanoplastics are being found in human placenta, both inside and outside the placenta, in baby poop um, and blood now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think the, the, there's like so, so many different environmental contributions along the supply chain, as Erica had indicated too, that, you know, we have multiple hits coming from basically every angle. So, you know, we find PFAS in babies, you know, when they do the finger pricks, when babies are born, um, we find PFAS chemicals in their blood. These chemicals are ubiquitous um, in terms of, it's very difficult to say exactly, um, you know, um, the degree to which these are causing our increased cancer rates, our increased um, rates of being immunocompromised. And um, so, but at the same time, we know that these, uh, especially when we're looking across the supply chain, that the supply chain itself is not equitably distributed across our uh, countries and our worlds. And just the, um, the pollutants that are uh, involved in the processing, transportation, um, and the deposition of these wastes are, are not impacting everybody equally. And I think that that's a, um, and we see that in life expectancy. Thank you. Yeah, I thought your, um, your charts that showed life expectancy and, and health outcomes overlaid with you know, the waste management is pretty powerful. Um, to kind of, one of the things that has been proposed in a few states in the United States already passed um, have been extended producer responsibility um, policies. And um, we have a question from Jay in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, who asks what efforts have been made to enforce extended merchant responsibility as much as extended producer responsibility from bags to cutlery, straws and containers, merchants buy this product as a supposed convenience for their customers. Erica? Sure, so when we, we talk about um, EPR schemes, we talk about usually um, local or um, regional legislation or as has been proposed by the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act in the US and also the uh, EU Single Use Plastic Directive regulations that require people who manufacture plastic to be accountable for it. So that means having some kind of plan to either um, pay for the collection and disposal and treatment of plastic, um, ways to easily collect it, et cetera. But when we're talking about merchants, we're talking about say like a restaurant or a retailer. Um, and there are local laws. I mean, we see them everywhere, including on Long Island, um, plastic bag bans, cutlery bans, et cetera. Um, and those, usually apply to people who um, sell plastic or products that are wrapped in plastic. There are sometimes loopholes. As I saw when I went to Hawaii, I detailed the crazy journey of what it takes to get effective plastic legislation on the table that can not only reduce our use of plastic, but also kind of get closer and closer to the source, which are the corporations churning out plastic. So that is the goal it is to get to the corporations and stop them from producing so much plastic and producing more plastic. Um, but that's happening very slowly. Um, but these laws that target you know, individual regions have cut down drastically. For example, in, in my county, Suffolk County, um, where CRIM is also located, um, a local legislator cited an 80% reduction in plastic bag use once our, um, our new plastic bag ban went into place, uh, but plastic bag tax went into place and now it is a ban. Um, so that is pretty remarkable. It's not a solution in terms of like, it's going to solve the problem, but it regionally um, that's a start. And it's clear that this piecemeal approach is not working. I mean, again, because of the interconnected nature of the earth and also of human society, there's gonna be plastic everywhere unless we all band together and, and come up with some kind of global plastic treaty, um, which is now being talked about and, and quite favorably by, um, by many people. So that's something to, to keep an eye out for. Thank you, yes. 
Well, so how do we also convince large companies to invest in non-plastic options for their products while staying affordable for consumers? So Ask Julia from Bellingham, Washington. Maybe Karim, want to tackle yeah. that one? I mean, I think it's a great question. I think that um, there's a need to regulate these issues to create a level playing field. No amount of corporate responsibility is going to solve this problem. And um, like Erica was saying, you know, when they when Suffolk County charged a five percent tax on paper and plastic single-use bags, in one year we reduced the number of plastic bags by an estimated 1.1 billion single-use plastic bags. Um, so yes, initially the cost went up for some consumers who forgot to bring their own bag. They paid five cents, and then they remembered the next time to. Um, bring a reusable bag. In uh, 2020, the county banned styrofoam, plastic straws. Um, and then seeing that localities could do this, New York State banned single-use plastic bags, which is an estimated 23 billion um, plastic bags a year. Uh, and I think it's important to say that, you know, even plastic bags have lobbies. So if plastic bags have lobbies, imagine, um, when thing you know as we go up the supply chain um and i think that none of this was easy but you know in order to convince companies to invest in non-plastic options it has to be a level playing field for them because if everybody doesn't do it it's very difficult and the way that happens i think is regulation legislation changes behavior and in the case of um you know we saw this in new jersey with their ban uh they had failed ban on on plastic bags. And it was the, again, because different communities were doing it all around the metro area and proving that it could happen without the sky falling in terms of prices going up to court, to consumers. Um, ultimately, the state of New Jersey next door was able to overcome the plastic bag lobby um, and do real progress. Thank you. Well, like connected to that is how do we move the federal Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act of 2020 in the United States forward? It seems to have stalled. It has mostly only Democratic co-sponsors. You have thoughts on that, Karim or Erica? Actually, I have a, before we get to that, I just have another thought about this last question too, because I think when we talk about the cost being passed on to consumers, we have to understand that at the end of the day, some plastic may be affordable because that cost is passed on to those who can least afford it. Um, and the cost is not just the price tag, you know, when it, uh, we have to talk about the full cost of plastic. Um, and that's the cost when it ends up on, uh, in the, on the coast of Turkey, when it ends up in the middle of the ocean, when it ends up in our groundwater. And, um, you know, where I live, we have to talk about the cost of, you know, trucking this waste into a community that has the second highest asthma ER rate. And those, you know, nope. Uh, we are all paying for that at the end of the day. Um, so sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I just think that no, that's- No, no, I completely, that that's a great point. Yeah, the externalized costs to all the entire planet and humanity um, are not being included. And they're not included in life cycle assessments and the studies that get rolled out again and again saying, you know, a plastic bag is better for the environment than a paper bag or a reusable bag and those kinds of things um, are used to prop up those myths. Um, but so, you know, for I think folks who are still sticking around and thank you for over 100 people who've stuck around for longer, um, you know, the Breakthrough from Plastic Pollution Act is something that is, is created out of state um, common sense policies that are already working in many states in the United States and, you know, similar to policies from around the world. Um, and it's something that would level the playing field um, with federal deposit systems, you know, national moratorium on petrochemical buildouts, and many other great things. Um, any thoughts from any of our panelists on on just you know national policies? Happy to weigh in a little bit here. Um, we have the EU roll out its single use plastic directive, which is an enormous um, geographic area affected now by this legislation. And they're rolling in um, various steps that are very similar to the, a lot of the steps in the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act um, to reduce plastic production, first of all, um, address the recycling issue, because we know that it's almost a myth, basically. Um, and, you know, how to how to manage waste in a more circular way um, and also just live 
put in a more circular way where we don't create so much waste. So a big beef I have with um, the idea of replacing plastic with a new material is that it still reinforces the issue that we have with this um, consumptive, very um, throwaway lifestyle. And that's producing waste of all kinds. And we have to look towards um, communities like Karim's and say, hey, listen, we can compost, we can do waste audits, we can understand what we're producing and kind of be accountable ourselves um, first. And I think that's really important. And that's why um, you know, getting up close with plastic and really understanding what it is and why it's here and why we use it and what we can do differently is so important. Um, and it and it's not, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's not us consumers, and I don't like to use that word consumers, but we've been basically sold plastic by corporations. They've done an, an excellent job of marketing this material, and it is the perfect um, consumer material because they just can keep making money from it as we throw it away and buy more. Um, and we have to realize that too. And culturally, we've come to a place where we rely on plastic. You know, we, we're on computers that are plastic. We have phones that are plastic. Our vehicles are made of plastic. Our clothes are made of plastic. It is literally everywhere. And just shutting down plastic production um, would make a huge impact on our planet and our lives and, and how we interact and see the world and, and interact with one another. Um, legislation can do enormous things. Um, we've seen it with um, the Stockholm Convention with banning uh, toxic chemicals. And that's, you know, that is critical. We do need bans sometimes because apparently we can't keep ourselves in check. Um, but if we can somehow pass legislation on a national scale um, and then hopefully look for some kind of global understanding and, and work together, um, we can do amazing things. And, you know, everything that I've read about the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, um, you know, it has really great goals. And I think that the more that we can get this out there and, and push for it, you know, talking about environmental justice, number one, um, refill and reuse programs. When I was living in Copenhagen, we had repair cafes, which are just these little shops, not shops, just little open spaces that you go into with anything that you have that might be broken, whether it's a suitcase, a pair of jeans, whatever. Um, and you go in and someone there teaches you how to fix it and it's completely free and you can sit there and have a coffee. It's really, it's a wonderful thing. And I think returning to our communities as you know, we see as an example that Sadat showed us in his community and Karim showed us in his community um, and looking you know, around you at the people around you, we have so much people power and there is so much that we can do. Um, it can feel daunting, but the steps are, are quite simple. I mean, um, you know, we see it again, composting, waste audits, understanding how to reuse different um, materials and items that we have around us is, is fundamental. So that's that's my advice. Um, yeah, vote is important too. Um, and and you know, spread the word, talk to people. That's important too. Thank you, Erica, that was terrific. And I love the, um, the right to uh, reuse and repair. It's also something that is a policy that folks are pushing for in a lot of states in the United States and around the world. Um, we have only a couple minutes left, so I wanted to just give um, Kiram and Sadat, if you wanted to take a minute for any closing thoughts, I think Erica really summed things up very nicely. Um, and we're sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but we will be sharing a recording and lots of links to amazing resources. And um, we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar too. So Kiram, closing thought. I think, I, I mean, personally, I'm just extremely ex inspired by the community that I've seen in the last hour and 15 minutes just on this Zoom. And I think uh, that, you know, these small conversations that we're having and not so small conversations from uh, a hyper local level to a global level, um, to me, I feel like there's no way we can't uh, actually achieve our goal of breaking free from petrochemical industries um, that are dictating our government policies and um, and really impacting our health and our safety. And uh, so I'm, I'm inspired. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Dr. Sadat? Yeah, thank you for attending this uh, amazing uh, event about plastic pollution and its uh, environmental effect. But uh, I should say that 
we are still in plastic crisis and the solve isn't uh, found yet and we are looking at the wrong, wrong direction like a uh, wrong solution all solution like bio-based biodegradable compostable or recycling uh, we should definitely tap uh, the, the, the turn the tap to to tackle this problem thank you thank everyone. you so much Thank you. And Erica, not to totally cut you off, I thought you did such a great job of that before. If there was anything last thing you wanted to say. So oh, grateful yeah. to have you all. Thank you, my fellow panelists. And this was a great conversation. Um, thanks for the plus thanks to the Plastic Pollution Coalition too for hosting us. Thank you. And then one last reminder, Island Press, 30% discount. We'll share the um, code again too. And um, you know, st we suck it in the link in the chat and then save the date. The next webinar is November 10th and the topic will be the Emmy winning film, The Story of Plastic, a conversation with filmmaker and frontline activists. And you can watch the film for free, for free on YouTube, Discovery Channel's YouTube channel where they've made it available through, Nove through November 30th, where you can see it all for free for, you know, another almost two months. So if you haven't seen it yet, check it out. They also have added um, uh, translations for 31 different languages. So uh, please share it in your local communities. And we really hope that um, everyone has a chance to see the film. It is an incredible um, kind of storytelling of the life cycle of the entire plastic supply chain and um, the environmental justice impact. So please, please check it out. Um, and then last but not least, if you haven't, join our global coalition. It's free. You can join as an individual, an organization, a business. Um, we welcome everyone interested in our, joining us in our cause for a world free of plastic pollution and uh, its toxic impacts. And we invite you to connect with us on social media to learn more. And we'll also be sending out a link to a survey um, in response to this webinar, we grateful for your feedback and your constructive criticism and your thoughts and ideas for other topics or ways to improve. And thank you to our panelists again, and Erica for your book and your work and everyone's work. Um, we couldn't do all this without our partners and your communities and networks. And we hope to see you in November for our next webinar. Thank you so much for being here.